Hi. In this video, I'd like to take a bit of a break from my Reconsidered series of videos and spend a few minutes telling you about how I personally view the task of thinking in its own right. I feel that this is important because the vision that animates my view of thinking implicitly shapes all of my YouTube videos as well as my work as a teacher. So it's important to take the time to tell you what I think is really going on beneath the surface of all of that as directly and unapologetically as I can. Basically, as a professor of philosophical psychology, all of my academic involvements are motivated by one principal underlying question. How can I engage in the most profound kind of inquiry into the human condition? Part of my personal answer to this broad question comes from Friedrich Nietzsche, and more specifically from his work on the advantage and disadvantage of history for life, the second of his untimely meditations. Here, Nietzsche suggests that the primary value of historical inquiry lies in its possible effects on the fundamental process of being alive. In other words, the real value of historical inquiry doesn't reside in its truth value or in the extent to which it's intellectually fashionable or clever, but in the ways it fosters a deeper relation to life itself. However, I feel that the same basic insight applies to psychological inquiry or to any inquiry into the human condition for that matter. So to me, psychology becomes genuinely profound when it has an appreciable effect on life itself, when it alters our actual experience of being alive as well as our fundamental orientation to the world that we inhabit. Of course, in academic contexts, it's often presumed that we're alive in order to think and understand things. However, in my view, it works mostly the other way around. We think and understand things in order to be more profoundly alive. In other words, when we're at our best, our thinking draws us into living more powerfully, more poetically, and more incisively. So, what kind of thinking brings about these sorts of effects? What kind of thinking embodies a powerful relation to life? Personally, I take a clue from the Bible where it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. In my experience, thinking about the human condition becomes powerful when it opens up the full panoply of life's possibilities, when it inaugurates a season for everything and excludes nothing, when it follows no particular programmatic agenda other than that of wandering nomadically across life's trackless expanses of space and time. Consequently, profound thinking doesn't seek to confine itself to what people commonly regard as morally, ethically correct or appropriate. On the contrary, profound thinking is likely to reveal new regions of the deviant and the inappropriate just as quickly as it affirms the status quo. And remember that without deviation, there's no progress or transcendence in our world. For instance, my own thinking is often drawn toward exploring dark, marginal phenomena like decadence and asceticism, libertinage, immorality, destructiveness, and nihilism as ways of widening the perimeter of what is psychologically comprehensible and loosening the programmatic constrictiveness of a lot of intellectual activity. However, I'm also interested in the kind of thinking that precipitates moments of discontinuity, surprise, and chaos in the regularity of the world as we habitually know it. To me, this kind of thinking is essentially shamanic in structure, especially insofar as it opens up a multiplicity of simultaneous worlds, rather than seeking to narrow and confine the world to the true, as though our current conception of truth could somehow contain all the charm and subtlety of the cosmos. For instance, as an academician, I'm interested not merely in increasing people's stock of knowledge, but in fostering profound experiences of unknowing. In my view, it's certainly important to know things, but it's equally important to develop the capacity to unknow them. By unknowing, I don't mean erasing or forgetting already existing knowledge, but allowing what we know to stand in relation to our ultimately mysterious universe. To unknow something is to allow it to become pregnant with endless mystery and miracle. Consequently, I see thinking and teaching basically as covert forms of thaumaturgy. Another example. 
I'm interested in thinking that opens up our sense for vastness, our sense for inhabiting the wide cosmos and for participating in the life process of all sentient beings. In this regard, it seems to me that a kind of imbalance exists in the way we typically construe the activity of thinking, usually as a way of becoming preoccupied with minutia at the expense of the immensity of things. However, to me, thinking is at its best when it embraces both sides of this wide spectrum. But because I perceive an imbalance in this area, I like to place emphasis on cultivating a relation to vastness and to the infinite through thinking. So on one hand, I'm interested in a kind of intellectual shamanism. However, I'm also very much interested in exploring the intersection between intellectuality and meditative consciousness. Here I take my inspiration from Buddhist texts such as Chogyam Trungpa's The Myth of Freedom, which view intelligence, for example, not in terms of cognitive speed and accuracy, but in terms of mindfulness and full presence, which in turn have to do with letting go of various attachments and obscurations. I feel that taking this idea to heart is tantamount to a revolution in thinking, mostly because it conjures a vision where thinking becomes an ongoing adventure in deepening one's entire consciousness and presence to the world, rather than consigning it to the category of mere cognition. However, Buddhist thought and meditative practice have entered into my thinking in another way. Over time, I find that I'm becoming increasingly willing to let go of things that seem trivial or unimportant, rather than fixating on them simply because that's what other people are doing. I sense that learning to let go of what seems inconsequential is helping me to stay focused on the kinds of thinking that seem genuinely profound and powerful. For instance, I find that the less I'm caught in the egoism of being a professor, the more profound and satisfying my thinking seems to become. For instance, in the past, a lot of my work as an academician was animated by the prospect of making some contribution that would somehow pass beyond the confines of my own life. To be taken up and propagated by my students or readers, for instance. However, now I'm happy to allow my thinking to be completely evanescent, to shimmer for a moment against the vast sky of the world, and then to vanish like a sand mandala. Consequently, over time, I've become less concerned with whether anyone, including myself, actually remembers what I think, or whether I leave any kind of mark as an intellectual. On the contrary, it seems to me that profound thinking is marked mostly by an aesthetic of disappearance, as a way of acknowledging and participating in the impermanence of all things, as opposed to having thinking serve as a bulwark for some overwrought idea of permanence or continuity. When I think about the colossal mass of knowledge produced by psychological inquiry over the last 130 plus years, I usually marvel at how inconsequential most of it seems. Of course, this state of affairs is not peculiar to psychology. In our information age, it's become a kind of epidemic raging over practically every academic discipline. In my view, the current malaise of information glut is without historical precedent. Throughout practically all of recorded history, humanity has struggled to add to its stock of knowledge. Only in our age has it become a daily labor to subtract from the overwhelming mass of knowledge in the right way, to locate the few facts we really need. Hence our current reliance on search engines, for instance. The irony of our time is that knowledge has become mostly a form of garbage, an impediment to accessing the comparatively few truths we desperately need. The disorienting reality of our era is that we already have too many books, too many articles, too many magazines and journals, a superfluity of blogs, channels, websites and pundits, theories, counter theories, conjectures and analyses. And yet the task of thinking still seems to be stuck in a paradigm where good thinking is, ipso facto, what adds even more to humanity's already gargantuan stock of knowledge. But for the most part, the problems that beset our world today are produced not by deficits in our stock of knowledge, but by our inability to live well with what we already know. In my view, cultivating the capacity to live well with what we already know is the real task of thinking in today's world. In other words, I believe that our world is calling for a fundamental paradigm shift in what thinking and knowledge are. Thinking's most important task today is essentially 
to reinvent itself. Consequently, I'm personally interested in exploring the kinds of thinking that paradoxically bring an end to thinking as we've known it. I'm interested in gaining the kind of knowledge that compels knowledge to reinvent its own definition. So, as an alternative to perpetuating thinking's moribund status quo, at least in my view, I'd like to propose that thinking adopt a mostly subtractive relation to knowledge. In other words, the best thinking in today's world may be the kind that sculpts away most of the epistemic ephemera and seeks to dwell at length, perhaps almost meditatively, with life's comparatively few enduring verities. For this reason, I like to think of myself as an unfashionable thinker who for the most part follows a circular and meditative model for thinking and knowing, rather than one that's linear and progressive. Basically, I'm pursuing a way of thinking that seeks not to understand many trivial things, but to fathom a few important ones. The German poet Rainer Maria Rilke once wrote, I live my life in ever-widening orbits which move out over the things of the world. Perhaps I can never achieve the last, but that will be my attempt. I am circling around God, around the ancient tower, and I've been circling for a thousand years. And I still don't know if I am a falcon or a storm or a great song. As in Rilke's poem, my own thinking is animated mostly by the spirit of repetition, by a desire to dwell at length with what seems important and resonant and luminous, simultaneously knowing and unknowing the world. However, I also realize that this makes me somewhat of an anomaly especially in today's academic environment, which tends to place considerable emphasis on ideas that seem current and fashionable. In practical terms, this usually means keeping one's academic references confined to an interval extending only five years or so into the past. However, in my view, the main effect of this kind of intellectual neophilia, which is essentially a form of impatience, is that it keeps thinking moving quickly, like sound bites, skipping over surfaces rather than plumbing depths. It keeps the machinery of academic production whirring frenetically, thereby exacerbating the problem of information glut. And it allows the academic world an easy self-justification in terms of the prevailing values of the economic marketplace. However, in the final analysis, it also costs the academic world a large part of its soul, its fundamental relation to life. In my view, this is a mistake, and my own thinking attempts to move in the exact opposite direction, into the nomadic desert of the unfashionable, the unproductive, and the non-telic. Another fundamental error that I find is often woven into the definition of thinking is that of undue seriousness. Question: Why is serious thinking, thinking that's full of gravitas, for instance, almost always immediately regarded as good thinking? On the other hand, why is thinking that's deemed light, ridiculous, or worse yet, laughable, almost always regarded automatically as bad thinking? One of the ironies of today's academic world is that calling someone's work a joke is extremely serious business. However, in my view, the actual value of thinking has little to do with whether it's serious or laughable, full of gravity or completely insouciant. In my experience, when thinking takes the form of joking and laughter, it often yields up more profound insights than serious thinking does. And yet, we in the academy are so quick to valorize serious scholarship, serious students, and serious ideas meant to be taken seriously. As a thinker, I've personally reached the point where I'm no longer content to be taken seriously. My aspiration is to become a profound thinker, not necessarily a serious one. And so I find that I'm increasingly willing to adopt a ludic approach to thinking and to allow my insights to take the form of jokes, satire, ironies, nonsense, incongruities, and the like, which I now see as virtues rather than as impediments to good thinking. 
Concomitantly, I find that I no longer feel particularly inclined to worship at the temple of logical or temporal consistency in what I think and say. I no longer feel compelled to believe today what I believed yesterday, or to continue espousing positions that I once held in the past. I've come to realize that the universe is broad enough to let us change our minds about what we think. It seems to me that the process of understanding things is at its best not when it takes the form of the competitive zero-sum game of attacking and defending intellectual positions, but when it invites open-ended playful metamorphosis. In this regard, Emerson once famously claimed that the will to a foolish constancy is the hobgoblin of small minds. And over time, I've come to appreciate and value his insight. The deeper truth, at least as I see it, is that life itself is largely inconsistent, paradoxical, contradictory, and capricious. And so it would seem incumbent upon those of us who would understand life to fashion a way of thinking that remains faithful to life's lack of constancy. In short, it's important for thinking and knowing to be able to contradict themselves and to open upon the vertiginous terrain of inconsistency and paradox. And finally, I suppose that at the end of the day, I see myself as a simple, straightforward thinker, almost like a child, but with a larger conceptual vocabulary. I don't see myself as a builder of complex and esoteric systems. I value lucidity, economy, and elegance in thinking. Of course, I realize that other people don't necessarily see my thinking as I do. However, I feel that if my thinking seems complex, it's only because of a kind of mirage produced by combining simple insights and realizations, perhaps in conjunction with my penchant for intellectual transgression. And also at the end of the day, I see myself simply as a human being who's grappling with the riddle of life and who's trying to apply his capacity for understanding to that fundamental task. This, I feel, is the leitmotif of everything I think and teach. Over time, I've come to believe that the programmatic content of my classes doesn't actually matter too much, at least not as much as it seems at first. It could be phenomenology, or it could be mathematics, or it could be art or computer science, but the underlying lesson would be the same. Life and death. And perhaps, in the final analysis, that's all I ever think and all I ever teach. Have a good day.